beaming to you from space. It's me, Lady Ada. I am one of the judges for the Hackaday Prize, and Hackaday has sent over a fine list of quality questions that they would like me to answer so that you know the kind of person that's judging you when you want to go to space. So let's begin. First up, where did the name Lady Ada come from? Good question, Hackaday. Lady Ada was my hacker handle when I was on IRC a lot, uh, wasting my time and also breaking into computers in the 90s. And since then, I've kind of kept that handle. It comes from Lady Ada Lovelace, who was the first programmer and also loved to gamble on horse racing. Next question. We imagine studying engineering at MIT to be as close to an educational playground as you can get. Are there any crazy projects, hackathon pranks from the time that you were there that you'd be willing to share? Another good question. Well, my favorite prank that I think that I pulled off personally was getting a Media Lab master's thesis in engineering by making a cell phone jammer. That was my thesis project. Uh, I, was, I basically did a thesis about design noir and personal space and technologies that help us reclaim personal space. And I really, really wanted to just build a cell phone jammer. This is a fun little project where you kind of annoy stores into a VCO and like really big RF antennas. You can see them over there on that side. And I made it sort of fit into a cigarette pack. And this was a, this was a project that I personally wanted. Like I just really wanted a cell phone jammer and I got a degree out of it. So I think that that was a pretty good hack. Next question. Adafruit Industries has made a real splash as far as publishing educational content. First of all, thank you. You're welcome. Secondly, how does this play into your business model and why do you think it's important? That's true. Adafruit Industries has a lot of tutorials. We have uh, all of them right now in the Adafruit learning system. It used to be in a wiki, which totally sucked. And then we designed our own content management system that was designed basically for me and the people that I hire to write tutorials. And we have like 500 tutorials. We might even be up to a 512 tutorials. So we need another bit to store all those tutorials. That's how many we've got. And they range from like every kind of project, from like how to blink an LED to like how to make a cell phone jammer, like all these ranges of projects from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And um, many of them use Adafruit products and kind of the way we do, do it is I basically stock the store with the stuff that I want to build projects with. Um, all kinds of sensors and amplifiers and dev boards and LEDs and blinkies and whatever. And then we do projects that help demonstrate what those components can do. And we publish them on the learning system so our customers have uh, Good documentation, how to get started. I kind of think of that as like the uh, you know quick start guide. Um, also, what it can do, how to hack it, um, mods, uh, you know, any kind of modifications that they want to make to use the projects that we've designed to make the projects that they want. So I think of it as kind of giving them a head uh, a leg up on the kind of uh, maker and hacker projects that people want to build. So yeah, I think of Adafruit as basically like a tutorial company, and you know we have this gift shop, which is all the cool electronic components that you can use to build all the tutorials. Next up, the Hackaday Prize has a judging preference for open design. Obviously, Adafruit shares this virtue as your products are all open. Can you tell us why you think there are more benefits to being open than not? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, you know, really a big proponent of open source hardware, also a big proponent of open source software. I used to do uh, more computer science and software and coding beforehand, then I moved into hardware because my wrist started hurting. Um, and now I just have like solder fumes everywhere. Uh, and Open source hardware is really cool because it allows people to share their designs and firmware and hardware and schematic layout with a really big community. And I think that the Adafruit community is so awesome. And, you know, I spend a lot of time engineering stuff and, you know, I have a team like including K-Town and Tony DeCola and others who design really, really great hardware and firmware and software, but there's nothing better than having a big community to come in and suggest even more stuff. Um, we get like pull requests on our GitHub repos like, four or five times a day, and we you know, try to integrate all these great upgrades and changes and bug fixes. Um, we have such a good community in open source hardware that I, I think there's a lot of benefit to joining it, and it's easy to join. All you have to do is open source something that you've made. Okay, next up. Making the transition from using dev boards and breakout boards to engineering and populating a single board project is a huge leap. What advice can you give for people interested in moving their skills up a level? That's right. Most makers uh, start with getting off-the-shelf modules, breakout boards, and you know dev boards like an Arduino or Arduino Shields, and they kind of cobble together their project and they get it working, and that's really cool. But then they're kind of like, well, I want something that maybe isn't available. I want a, a breakout for a chip that's not got a breakout already, or maybe I want to have a custom board that's extra low power, extra small, and that's where designing your own circuit board is 
totally awesome. And it's a skill that I think everyone should you know, eventually try to get, especially if you're really interested in electronics. Well, I always do suggest that people start with breakout boards and not just like, oh, hey, you buy it from Adafruit. You can get breakout boards from all over the place uh, with a range of different sensors and outputs and inputs and displays and everything. It just really helps because oftentimes it comes with tutorials or example code and you can breadboard it and get the layout at least of your project right. Because a lot of people have like a lot of assumptions about you know how many pins they'll need and how much power it's going to draw and how much space it's going to take and, and you know there's going to be interference or collisions or does that sensor even really measure measure what you think you want to measure. So getting a breakout board is just a good way to just like prototype your design. And then if the uh, company that you bought your stuff from uses open source hardware like Adafruit and others, you can often download the files for those breakout boards like, uh, you know, EagleCAD or KiCAD or, or you know, PCB123 or whatever, and then just copy and paste those designs into your own circuit board layout using, you know, whatever layout software they use or, you know, trace it out into your own software. Um, and by, by having those files available, it makes it very easy to, you know, grab all the pieces that you need to make the custom design you want. So I think just start with something kind of basic, maybe 20 components, and try spinning up your board. We'll talk about in a little bit uh, some suggestions on where to get your PCBs made as well. Okay, next up. We've noticed a few posts on the Adafruit blog about new assembly equipment you've been acquiring. Why is local manufacturing important to you? Where are your boards fabricated and do you have any plans to produce them on site in the future? Yes, that's right. I have been acquiring much equipment. Uh, last year around this time we took a delivery of uh, advanced high-speed flex mounters, a pick-and-place machine uh, from Samsung called the SM41. We had a pick-and-place beforehand but it was kind of like a pocket pick-and-place, little mini one, little uh, apartment size one. This one is much bigger. You can see me here uh, measuring how big it is with my calipers. It's very big. It's more than six inches on each side. Comes uh, on a freight truck, and uh, we put big googly eyes on them because, well, you, know, you got these big googly eyes. What else are you going to put them on? I think it looks cute. Like, it's got these little teeth and tongues sticking out. And uh, these are the feeders that come in it. And, and components that you buy on cut tape or reel get loaded into the feeder, and then it gets automatically placed by the machine. The machine's very, very fast. It places like 30,000 components per hour. This is a little bit sped up. It's a little like vine loop thingy like you kids always use. Uh, but it does place components very fast and very, very accurately. And what this means is that I can manufacture more stuff with finer pitch components and with much higher yields. All this means I can do more stuff, more parts, at a lower cost. So we're actually going to get another one installed this week. Uh, this is an SM481, which even though is one digit less than the 42, is actually the upgrade. Yeah, whatever, Samsung, get with it. Uh, but this machine, same size, but has uh, 10 nozzles to pick up parts instead of six. That's about like, you know, 25, 30% faster. And uh, this will be uh, in line in our, our fabrication line. Um, there will be a stenciler, and we'll, we have a the speed line stenciler uh, here. Uh, and that's the machine that um, squeegees the paste on. So instead of like soldering each part, it actually um, squishes a paste on like a stencil. Um, you can see the stencil there, like a, a screen print, and puts the paste perfectly onto the circuit board so that every single pad has a little bit of paste on it. And then the components go into the pick and places and they get all the parts placed on top, the surface map parts, and then uh, they go into the oven to be reflowed. So yeah, it's a lot of equipment and it's like really expensive. It's like, uh, you know, these cost like a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars easily depending on what extras you get. If you get it, um, you know, a used or a demo model, uh, you know, something to be a little bit cheaper, but uh, often uh, you want to get like a really good machine with good training. I think we got a really, uh, you know, strong amount of equipment. And um, we don't uh, manufacture our own PCBs because PCB manufacturers actually requires very, very specialized equipment. Um, and you kind of have to do like 24 hour manufacturing for it to make sense because of the way they would claim the metal. Like if you don't have it running 24 hours, it's like very uh, uh, energy consuming. So instead we get our PCBs made elsewhere. I don't think that, I don't know of any uh, electronics in-house manufacturer that also makes their own PCBs. Usually. Uh, it's not unusual to do your own, um, you know, stenciling, pick and placing, reflowing, rework, and maybe even through whole soldering and packaging, but it's unusual to actually make PCBs in houses because of the, um, the chemistry and uh, the metal reclamation. Kind of a pain to get all that equipment in. Uh, okay, and uh, next up. Oh, sorry. That's right. The next question was uh, where do you suggest get PCBs made? Well, uh, 
I suggest if you're in the US to get made, PCBs made by Advanced Circuits, they actually have a pretty good uh, proto panel thing for like 33 bucks each and they have a couple deals. And they make like really, really excellent quality circuit boards. And um, I think especially if you're starting out, you want really good quality PCBs that don't delaminate easily, um, that have tests, that have like, you know, really good silk screen and um, they, their silk screen is like totally gorgeous and solder mask and it's like always perfectly aligned. They make, you know, they do up, up to mil spec, but you know, and, and 10 layer boards, but they can also do your two layer boards really easily. And if you're starting out and you want like, you know, small production quantities or prototype quantities, also check out OSH Park, which is, uh, they also have, um, a large ecosystem and a website where you can share designs and they're also super into open source hardware and uh, sharing layouts and uh, they make those purple PCBs that probably you've used or seen somewhere. Uh, so check out Lane, he's got some awesome stuff going on there. Next up, okay, do you still have time for hobby electronics? Do you have any non-engineering related hobbies? That's right, I do have many non-engineering hobbies such as engineering. Uh, layout, soldering prototypes, testing, writing firmware, um, reading electronics blogs, all these like non-engineering related hobbies. Uh, I actually do spend a lot of my time uh, doing engineering still at Adafruit, but I love it, so it's cool. And one of the nice things about having my own company is I actually get to have my personal projects be a uh, company projects. Like for example, I really wanted a color mini pop project. Here's Angel demoing the mini pop four, which is a new version of our little mini pop kit, a, a beginning soldering kit for learning how to solder components. Uh, these are really popular with people. This one, you can upload images over USB and it's color and it's kind of cool. Uh, another project I really wanted, I always wanted when I was a kid, one of those like little arcade froggers. Like, I don't know if you're around my age, maybe you remember those little, little mini arcade games. I never got one, but I really wanted one. So I got one and it runs on Raspberry Pi. And it can run all the games so I can play Pac-Man on it. Yes. Uh, I also would love to do kind of like weird synthesizer type music and I always wanted an open source grid controller so you know now I can like make custom ones like this gigantic 8x16 with white LEDs um, and you know I have like a laser cutter that I can play with and like it's the company's laser cutter and like I make cool projects on it and then I'm like I'll sell it. Uh, I also um, have this uh, cool uh, Game Girl Raspberry Pi edition Let's see what this is playing. This is playing Zelda right now. But uh, I finally finished Zelda, and I might play like a Final Fantasy uh, 1 again or something. Um, let's see, what else do I got here? Yeah, and, uh, and basically like any other kind of project that you see. Like, I just love building stuff, and uh, now I get Adafruit to do it for me. Okay, next up. Can you tell us a little bit about the hardware scene in New York City is like? Uh, yeah, New York City is like, uh, when I moved here, it was um, not considered a super hardware-y place. There's a lot of finance and maybe a little bit of software going on here. But now we actually have a really wide range of hardware startups and like hardware interests. We've got Little Bits, which is actually only a couple blocks away in Soho. That's Aya Badir's uh, open hardware, like learning electronics company. Check that out. They've got this awesome uh, Moog uh, uh, Korg synth project and the NASA synth project. Uh, NASA, NASA uh, science projects that you can build with little bits. Uh, we also have um, New York City Resistor, which is a, which is a really big and, and uh, you know very early hacker space in the, the new round of maker hacker spaces, as well as other uh, many other uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan um, and, and Long Island uh, hacker space as well. There's like four or five of those, and we also have like a, a really large number of 3D printing stores and companies as well. There's actually like another 3D printing stores that just opened uh, in like Midtown this weekend. So I'm gonna go check that out. But you know, if you're into like any of this stuff, open hardware making or um, 3D printing, like New York City is the place to be. Okay, finally, last question: What else is going on in your life? All sorts of things. Um, well, uh, I'm working on Circuit Playground, which is the uh, kids uh, half animated, half Muppet show that we're doing. I actually had uh, my friend Amanda, uh, the Waz, Wozniak, no relation, uh, in to do D is for diode, and which she dressed up as a diode and talked about diodes, and uh, it was totally cool. We had some great animations, and it's a great show, so we're up to D, and we're going to be doing E for electronics next, so check that out. Um, I'm also this month doing uh, a lot of promotion with Made With Code. This is a Google effort. Uh, you can see this is uh, me wearing the LED scrolling hat. There's another project that I always really wanted. I want an LED scrolling hat uh, and an LED umbrella and talking to um, some awesome girls at the Made With Code event. And this is a Google effort to get uh, young girls or actually anyone. Like you can, you, don't have to be, you, can be, you can be a cat and be interested in making stuff with code. 
And uh, check out the Made With Code website for more info about that and share it with someone you love who is interested in maybe learning how to code. A lot of great tutorials and projects. We also do every week a show and tell. You can show up even if you're not an Adafruit customer. It's cool. Uh, as long as you can get onto the Google Plus, check out the uh, Hangout at uh, Google, uh, our Google Plus page at plus, uh, Google, uh, sorry, plus.google.com slash plus symbol Adafruit. And look for the post where we say, uh, comment here to get added to a show and tell circle. We do that 7.30 p.m. every week on Wednesday. And then right afterwards at 8 p.m. on Wednesday, we do Ask Engineering, which is a one hour uh, show about electronics, open source hardware, all the cool gossip, all the cool products. Uh, data sheets, components, you name it. Sometimes we show off a cat, photo, all sorts of good stuff. We give away a prize at the end, and that's on uh, Ustream and YouTube. So there's a lot of stuff going on here at the Adafruit factory. Um, personally, I'm working on some cell phone stuff. I want to make really teeny cute little cell phones. This is a little mini cell phone. Um, using these great all-in-one cell phone chips that are getting onto the market now for wearables and such, and so I'm going to be doing a lot more cell phone stuff and uh, remote data access and actuation. I think that's kind of like the Internet of Things, but I want to make it so it's uh, super easy and fun and, and useful for makers to do. So yeah, a lot of stuff coming out from Adafruit, so uh, check in with what we're doing. And of course, enter the Hackaday Prize, which is why you're watching this, of course. Uh, the Hackaday Prize uh, will send you to space or many other fabulous prizes. All you have to do is enter on hackaday.com. And I will judge you and maybe shoot you to the moon.